what happens when you re remove two to three million whales in a very short period of time. If you lived in New England in the mid to late 19th century, chances are the flames lighting your home, just like the ones guiding ships back to shore, were powered by whale oil. And our mass consumption of these gigantic mammals didn't just change our lives, it altered the makeup of the entire oceans. How could just a few decades of human exploitation have such a global impact? I'm Shane campbell Staten, and this is Human Footprint. Welcome to the land of giants here. Wow. Oh, see, hell to the yeah. This is crazy. How many whales do you have here? We have every species that's on the planet is represented in our collection. Oh. Nick Pyanson is a biologist who studies ancient whales. So he spends a lot of time with fossils that are tens of millions of years old. But he's no stranger to living whales either. If there's a question about whale diversity and evolution, you can probably find an answer okay. with one of these specimens. This is Nick's happy place, a Smithsonian storage facility in Maryland he calls the Whale Warehouse. And I know every collection has its unique smell, yeah. but what the hell is it that I'm smelling right now? So you're smelling whale oil just everywhere, and it's whale okay. oil that's hundreds of years old that still hasn't really leached out of the bones. Oh, it's seeping day. out of the bones now. Yeah. Let me have you take a deep whiff of this one over here. Okay. Are you, oh, oh you yeah, just that's, get way yeah, up in just, there, well, huh? Well, that's, you know, it's biology. You gotta get all up in the business. All right, let's. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, God, yeah. That's... So I, you know, that's, you know, I, don't, I have my own way of describing that. It feels like knowledge to me, but yeah. maybe to you it's just, you know, uh, death warmed over. There's knowledge in the stank is what, is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, that's a good okay. way of putting it. I, <laughs> okay. I might borrow that in the future. So, um, you know, why is it like that? Well, these animals have blubber in life. Fat is really important for sustaining themselves. These animals live in very large environments where their food is patchy. You need to have a lot of fat reserves to make it so that, you know, you don't eat every day. But when you do eat, you just feast, store it, and then end up migrating sometimes really, really far. So fat is a really important part of their life history, um, and it ends up in their bones, all around their bodies. So they're not just big boned, it is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's a really good way. Yeah. Now, I've seen a lot of biological specimens in a lot of museum collections, but nothing like this. So here are the jaw bones. What the <laughs> hell? These are the jaw bones of a blue whale. Bruh, this is ridiculous. Inside are the jaw bones of a bull sperm whale that was 60 feet long. The owner of the blue whale jaw bones was 92 feet long. Whoa. And here's the crazy thing you are looking at the largest single bone in the history of life. There is no dinosaur bone, mammoth tusk, nothing is as big as this bone. Wow. So this is it. And we'll never collect something like this again. These are blue whales from the Southern Ocean, and this was collected at a time when there was still a lot of whaling going on. Yeah. Especially in that part of the world, where some two to three million whales were killed. This was one of them. Even the biggest animals that ever lived aren't off limits for the planet's top predator. But why? I mean, there's got to be an easier way to eat. So here we have a gray whale skeleton that's at least a thousand years old. Okay. Um, and it's from the coast of North Carolina. And I can show you right here. You have uh -huh. these nice butchery marks right there. Our ancestors in the human lineage were using stranded whales as a resource, either for meat, maybe for the bones. But at some point, stranded whales weren't enough anymore. So at some point, you have, there's like two dudes like sitting on the beach and one turns to the other and is like, oh man, you see that gargantuan thing out there? Let's go get it. Bet money. <laughs> Bet money, I can kill it. I think that bet probably ended badly most of the time. <laughs> yeah. The technology to actually have a successful hunt really didn't come
come together until about a thousand years ago. And the purpose of that hunting, was it for food or other purposes? For mostly not for food, but for oil. Whale oil was really, really good. Great lubricant, burned really cleanly. Whale oil lit New England in the middle to late 19th century. And it was only with the discovery of actual petroleum, oil from the ground, where it no longer made economic sense. The efficiency of 20th century whaling had a devastating impact. We didn't actually know how many whales there were in the world's oceans, so why did it matter? There is just no limits. There were so many whales in the Southern Ocean, why not? So by the U.S. Marine Mammal Protection Act in 1972, 99% of the blue whales that were alive in 1900 were gone. How do we know that number specifically? Whaling is an industry that kept logs and data. There are 37 volumes like this, and they all have page after page after page of individual whale. And when it was killed, the whale number, male, female, and measurements of its mm. carcass. Flipping through these pages is almost like watching whales disappear all over again. People guess that it's in maybe the few hundreds. Okay. 600, 800 blue whales globally made it through the 20th century. Wow. It turns out that these ocean giants have a massive role to play in marine ecosystems. You could add up the biomass of all the wild mammals on the planet today. Just think about tigers, lions, elephants. Mm -hmm all the wild mammals on the planet. The level of biomass of whales before industrial whaling was some two, maybe three times as large as that. So the number of whales that were removed just in a few decades, not even in a hundred years, was two to three times the total biomass of all wild mammals that today. exist on this planet today. And it's not just the whales themselves that the ocean lost, but all the things they did, like eat. So here's a jar of krill. OK. And this is the stuff that giants are made of. Exactly. Yeah, that's a really good way of putting it. And in the Southern Ocean, there's more krill than basically anything else. So if the giants are gone, are our oceans just stock full of krill now? Yeah, so that's the krill paradox, right? Removal of whales. Is that what it's actually that's called? That's what it's actually called in literature. That's yeah, that's people great... have been calling that for decades, the krill paradox. Wow, that'd be a great band name. <laughs> yeah, so a uh, krill paradox is that with the removal of whales, you expect there'd be mm -hmm. so much more krill. Turns out that's not the case. Krill have actually dropped in numbers. How does that work? So there's a feedback loop here, and it goes back to whales feeding and then pooping in the upper layers of the water column, okay. right in the photic zone. The photic zone is the layer of water near the ocean's surface where light can penetrate and plant life can grow. Whales spend a lot of time deep underwater, but they have to surface to breathe. And it turns out that's where they do most of their pooping too. So when whales aren't there, they are not fertilizing the oceans as much as they otherwise would be. They're mobilizing nutrients, so that includes phosphorus or nitrogen and phytoplankton, zooplankton like krill. They're gonna need these nutrients to build these incredibly productive, healthy mm. food webs. So whales are dependent on the krill, but the krill are also dependent on the whales. Whales are essentially kind of in a way farming krill with their poop. And that's why we call them ecosystem engineers. The chemistry of the oceans too changed with the removal of all those whales. Wow. Wow. I think it's a source of wonder to live alongside some of the largest species, not just on the planet right now, but to have ever evolved in the history of life on this planet. Yeah. How lucky are we? And we nearly snuffed them out. Now, the fortunate thing is they didn't go extinct. So I kind of think we have a second chance in the 21st century to make a greater impact. If you want more Human Footprint, you can tune in to the full-length series on the PBS app or your local PBS station. Check out the link in the description to watch a full episode and to find out more about the show.